Morning, how you doing? Going to uh, 27,000 feet, we're a little north of the supersonic corridor. We'll be turning in over western three sisters and entering the uh, corridor. And we'll accelerate out to Mach 1. I'll give you a call when we start in, and we'll probably hit about 1.4. Joe, we're in the supersonic quarter at uh, 31,000 feet. Uh, we just passed Mach 1, and we'll stay in AB. Uh, we'll probably hit about 144. I'll keep you in five. Pretty simple, but it wasn't always this way. Fifty years ago, he was flying a very different airplane, a small rocket plane, and he was just hoping to get through what was then called the sound barrier. The problem he was facing was called compressibility, the strange behavior of airflow as its velocity approached the speed of sound. It had been encountered by fighter pilots during the recent war. Pushing over into steep dives, they'd found themselves at speeds of 500 miles per hour, roughly 75% of the speed of sound, and into the lower limits of the unknown region of transonic flight, where the effects of compressibility, loss of control, and structurally devastating aerodynamic loads began to take over with often deadly consequences. Aerodynamicists knew that as aircraft entered the transonic region, the region between 0.7 and 1.3 Mach, they were passing into an area of unpredictable airflow conditions. Even at subsonic speeds, the airflow over the wings could be supersonic, and this caused shock waves, which violently disrupted the airflow and drastically altered an airplane's controllability. Furthermore, Many of them theorized that as an aircraft approached the speed of sound, or Mach 1, a virtual wall of air would build up in front of it, which would be impenetrable. The man who, more than anybody else, was responsible for the airplane, which would disprove the myth of a sound barrier, was Major Ezra Kotcher of the Engineering Division at Wright Field. As early as 1939, while still a civilian teaching at the Air Corps Engineering School, he was aware that wind tunnels, which choked at transonic velocities, would never solve the problem. Thus he proposed that the Air Corps should build an experimental airplane, which would have to be powered by some form of unconventional propulsion, perhaps a rocket engine. The leadership of the new U.S. Army Air Forces turned a deaf ear on his proposal until the advent of turbojet technology made it clear that the means were now at hand to propel aircraft in level flight speeds well above those that conventional piston engine fighters could attain only in steep dives. Meanwhile, John Stack, a research scientist for the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, or NACA, had arrived at the same conclusion, and he'd convinced the NACA to pursue, with the military's assistance, the development of a transonic research airplane. 
Stack and Kotcher disagreed, however, over both means and ends. John Stack wanted a conventional turbojet-powered aircraft to acquire data at speeds approaching Mach 1. He got his airplane, but it was acquired for the NACA by the Navy. First flown in 1947, the Douglas D558 Skystreak would exceed Mach 1 only once while in a steep dive in late September 1948. Kotcher, on the other hand, from the very outset, insisted on a rocket-powered airplane capable of attaining speeds in excess of Mach 1. And by early 1944, he'd come up with a preliminary design for an aircraft which would be built around a 6,000-pound thrust liquid-fuel rocket engine. This served as a starting point for the Bell Aircraft Corporation when in December 1944, Kotcher negotiated a contract to design and build an airplane capable of speeds in excess of 800 miles per hour. Because they knew 50 caliber bullets were stable at supersonic speeds, Bell engineers shaped the fuselage accordingly. Because no one knew what they'd encounter at the speed of sound, the airframe was stressed to withstand more than 18 Gs. And while John Stack was none too optimistic about the prospects for a rocket plane, especially one which would have to be air launched, the NACA made major inputs to the design process. Based on evidence that thin wings retained more effective lift in the transonic region, the agency recommended that the airplane be configured with what, for the day, were extremely thin airfoils. Equally important, the NACA insisted that the elevator should be placed on an all-moving horizontal tail, which could, if necessary, be employed to maintain control of the airplane at extremely high speeds. After overcoming a host of unknowns and design problems, Bell completed the first X-1 in December of 1945. Because development of its reaction motors XLR-11 rocket engine had lagged, it was transported to Pine Castle Army Airfield in Florida for a series of unpowered glide tests aimed at demonstrating the feasibility of air launch operations as well as the basic flying qualities of the X-1. Bell's chief test pilot, Jack Woolhams was selected as project pilot for the X-1 program, and on January 25, 1946, he dropped away from the B-29 launch aircraft for the first time. A skilled and experienced test pilot, Woolhams thoroughly enjoyed the flight and reported that of all the aircraft he had flown, the X-1 was, in his words, the most delightful one to fly of them all. He completed a total of 10 glide flights at Pine Castle, but weather problems and a series of landing mishaps had delayed the program and convinced the Air Force that the powered flights should be conducted elsewhere. Jack Woolhams was scheduled to make those flights. In August, however, he was tragically killed while flying a souped-up P-39 in preparation for the 1946 Thompson Trophy air race. The X-1 would fly at another location and with another pilot in the cockpit. That location was Muroc Army Airfield on California's high desert. Its clear skies, isolation, and the tremendous margin of safety afforded by its immense dry lake bed, which served as a natural landing field, made it the ideal place to test an exotic, ultra-high performance airplane such as the X-1. Bell's new pilot, was 23-year-old Chalmers H. Slick Goodland. Under the terms of the acceptance program, Bell was only obligated to demonstrate the X-1's airworthiness up to a speed of 0.8 Mach. But if the airplane held together, the chances were that Slick Goodland would have the opportunity to make the assault on Mach 1. But first, preparations had to be completed for Bell's acceptance program. The 6,000-pound thrust XLR-11 rocket engine, for example, underwent exhaustive ground tests. Pressurized by nitrogen gas and employing liquid oxygen and water alcohol as propellants, each of its four chambers provided 1,500 pounds of thrust. By means of a switch on the control yoke in the cockpit, the pilot could ignite or shut down each chamber individually, so it could operate at 25, 50, 75, 
or 100% power. The purpose of the program was, of course, to acquire information about the transonic flight regime. Walter C. Williams headed up an NACA contingent of engineers and technicians who were responsible for instrumenting the X-1 and then acquiring, reducing, and analyzing the data. Though primitive by latter-day standards, the X-1 was the most thoroughly instrumented airplane of its day, carrying roughly 500 pounds of onboard acquisition and recording instruments to obtain data on stability, control, and air loads. In addition, radar, a technology new to flight test, would be employed to track the X-1 in flight. The powered flight program got underway at Muroc on December 9, 1946, as the B-29 mothership cleared the runway and commenced its long, slow climb to altitude. The moment of truth finally occurred at 27,000 feet as the launch count ended and the X-1 dropped away from the bomb bay of the B-29. During 22 powered flights over the next seven months, Bell met its contractual requirements as Goodland attained a top speed of 0.82 Mach, about 550 miles per hour, and demonstrated the structural ruggedness of the airplane by performing 8G pull-ups at speeds as high as 0.8 Mach. While this program was proceeding, a tortuous deliberation process was underway concerning who would fly the accelerated program for the assault on Mach 1, the NACA or Bell. By any definition, those flights would be research flights, and the NACA had the charter for flight research. But it hadn't shown any eagerness to risk the hazards of flying the rocket plane, and it had submitted a test plan, which would probably take more than a year to complete. The Air Force had aircraft in near-term development which promised to fly well into the transonic region. There was no time for delay. The assault on Mach 1 would also, by definition, be an envelope expansion program, and such hazardous tests were usually performed by the manufacturer. Bell desperately wanted the program, but post-war R&D budgets had been slashed, and the Air Force couldn't afford Bell's price. Faced with this dilemma, Colonel George F. Smith chief of the experimental aircraft section at Wright Field made a strikingly bold decision. He called Colonel Albert Boyd, chief of the flight test division, and asked him if he thought one of his pilots could take on the program. Boyd's enthusiastic reply was, you bet. Considered the father of modern Air Force flight testing, Boyd was eager to prove that one of his military pilots could successfully conduct a highly experimental research program. First, he had to make one of the most important and difficult decisions of his career, selecting the pilot to fly the airplane. From a list of more than 100 pilots, he carefully winnowed out the names of all but the very best and then repeated the process again and again. It came as a surprise when he ultimately selected a very junior test pilot. But Boyd considered 24-year-old Captain Charles E. Chuck Yeager best instinctive pilot he'd ever seen, and he demonstrated an extraordinary capacity to remain cool and disciplined under pressure. A fighter race during World War II, Yeager's always attributed this to his combat experience. The one advantage that I had probably uh, in, in doing research flying was I had been very disciplined in combat, meaning if you have no control over the outcome, forget it. Duty is paramount. That's you got duty to do. You fly, it. and when you fly combat, you know that a lot of people are going to get killed. You just hope, since you have no control over it, and if you get killed, you don't know anything about it anyway. So, so you you wipe it out of your mind, and you're able to for, ignore it completely and concentrate on what you're doing. So it was real easy to me, for me to transition into research flying and test work because uh, I could concentrate on what I was doing probably without worrying about the outcome. Boyd chose another extraordinarily gifted pilot, First Lieutenant Bob Hoover, as Jaeger's backup and chase pilot. He assigned yet another test pilot, 
Captain Jackie L. Ridley, who had a master's degree in aeronautical engineering from Caltech, as the engineer in charge. Well, Jack, see, Hoover and I were definitely not <laughs> flight test engineers. We could fly airplanes, and we had an, uh, an instinct, you know, for aerodynamics. But Jack Ridley was a brain. Jack Ridley knew everything there was to know about aerodynamics, and he was practical. And that's exactly it. And besides that, he was a good pilot, and he fit in with us. Finally, Boyd selected one of his best multi-engine test pilots, Major Robert L. Bob Cardenas, to fly the B-29 launch aircraft. As the ranking officer, he'd also serve as the officer in charge of the X-1 test unit at Muroc. When the team arrived at Muroc in late July 1947, Jaeger, Hoover, and Ridley were provided training on the X-1 and all of its systems by Richard H. Dick Frost. Frost, who had been Bell's chief flight test engineer on the airplane, was on loan to the Air Force to provide technical guidance and to fly low chase on all of Jaeger's missions. Dick uh, knew the X-1 intimately. Uh, he knew all the mechanics of it, and he, uh, it was his, his job to teach us everything that a pilot could do, you know, to the X-1 from the cockpit. Though he didn't have much of a technical background, Yeager proved to be a quick study, or as Ridley observed, he never studied engineering, but he blots the stuff up as fast as it's poured. After four days of schooling, Jaeger was ready for the first of three unpowered familiarization flights. On August 6th, he dropped away from the B-29 at 26,000 feet and, to everyone's surprise, almost immediately performed a series of slow rolls. That's a fighter pilot. That, to me, you know, that's the way I was trained. And, and upside down and right side, that doesn't make any difference to, to a fighter pilot. That's, that's where you live, you know. And I just wanted to see what the airplane rolled like. It, fit, it was beautiful. God, what a neat airplane to fly. During his third flight, he actually engaged Bob Hoover in a mock dogfight. Well, he, Bob is always doing something to keep you alert, as he puts it. And, it, it, you know, he's mischievous in an airplane. You've know, you got to watch yourself around him. He, he's always jumping. You the, and after two glide flights and sitting out there letting him make him passes at me, then uh, I went and broke into him when he made a pass at me, and, and we got this luff bear on the way down, and well, I, I don't have any power, and he's got, he's got power, but the X-1's a pretty neat airplane, to, pretty light and pretty, turns pretty good, and I could, I could stay with him until, you know, we looked down, and I said, man, I could roll this thing out and start thinking about landing. Members of the NACA contingent were dismayed and more than a little impressed by such antics. Test pilot Herb Hoover reported, this guy Jaeger's pretty much of a wild one, but believe he'll be good. On first drop, he did a couple of rolls right after leaving the B-29. On third flight, he did a two-turn spin, but still believe he'll be good. He's given us a good story of his three flights. On the morning of 29 August, Jaeger crawled back into the bomb bay of the B-29 and descended to the cockpit of the X-1 prior to his first powered flight. This was also supposed to be a familiarization flight, and Colonel Boyd had issued strict orders that he was not to exceed 0.82 Mach, the speed already cleared by Bell. Following launch at 21,000 feet, he followed the flight plan as he ignited and then shut down each of the rocket chambers in sequence. He then climbed upward at 0.7 Mach until he leveled off 45,000 feet. Then, all of a sudden, the fighter jock once more took over, and Jaeger dove toward the base. It was my understanding, you know, at least I felt that if I can, I'll fly the airplane as fast as I think it feels good. Well, you know, that maybe that's right, maybe it isn't. But anyway, when I came down across the field and fired off all four chambers, pulled the airplane up, and did a roll, 
And man, that thing was really smoking out. When I got up to 8.5, mocked them. Well, it felt good going through 8.3, 8.4, 8.5, and that's where, where I raked it off. And I raked the rockets off and came on down. Afterwards, Colonel Boyd fired a rocket of his own. Well, the old man bounced right back at us with, with a pretty hot letter. You will reply by endorsement as to why you exceeded the 8.2 Mach number. Well, Ridley and I sat down, and he he wouldn't help me answer it. He said, you flew it, you answer it. And I said, okay. And I just tr tried to slough it over that I thought the airplane felt good enough to go to 8.5. And that was the end of it. The old man never said anything. Else. But there'd be no more breaches of test discipline. On his very next flight, Yeager accelerated all the way out to 0.89 Mach and began to encounter buffeting, accompanied by a nose-down trim change and right-wing heaviness. Two flights later, at 0.9 Mach, the X-1 began to nose up and the buffeting became severe. He was now flying in a region where no man had flown before. In early October, he hit 0.94 Mach. Post-flight data analysis revealed that aircraft trim had once again reversed to nose down. This had Walt Williams and the NACA engineers worried. They urged caution as Jaeger approached higher speeds because the X-1 might well depart from controlled flight. At this point, however, he remained confident. Jack and I talked about this. I thought I could handle the airplane. That never worried me one bit. And Jack, I said, if this thing, you know, begins, I, I can fly it. That's the way I felt. And, and it didn't bother us, but it bothered uh, the NACA guys quite a bit. His confidence plummeted, however, during his eighth powered flight on 10 October when as his Mach meter indicated a speed of 0.94 Mach at 40,000 feet. I tried to turn the airplane and nothing happened. The controls became very sloppy and I didn't understand really what was happening because it's a strange feeling when nothing responds to what you're doing. And so I re raked off the, the rockets and the jettisoned the fuel and came on down and, and uh, got jacked. I said, man, we got a serious problem. When they reviewed the data, they realized what had happened. We saw the shock wave, which had formed on the fixed part of the horizontal stabilizer as well as on the wing, uh, at about 8.8. Eight. When we got back to 9.4, the shock wave was laying down and moving back on the airfoil and was at the hinge point of the elevator. And when this occurred, behind that shock wave, the elevator had no effectiveness and we lost the effectiveness. And that's where then Ridley's brain came in. Ridley's got figured out, you know, we've got a capability of moving the horizontal stabilizer, and if we can get this thing to working, we'd never used it before. And if you think you're good enough to fly with a crude method like this trimmable horizontal stabilizer, he said, I think you can control this airplane through Mach 1. As preparations got underway for his next flight, Yeager was in for yet another surprise. Post-flight data analysis revealed that on his 10 October flight, he'd actually attained a top speed of 0.997 Mach. He was tantalizingly close, and thus, as Bob Cardenas lifted off from the Muroc runway on the morning of October 14th, there was an air of keen anticipation, tinged with apprehension. This could be the flight would Jaeger actually be able to control the X-1 by making fine adjustments to the movable tail? And was there a wall at Mach 1? At 7,000 feet, he once again made his way down to the X-1's hatch and suffering from broken ribs sustained in a horseback riding accident, painfully crawled into the cockpit. As the B-29 continued its climb, he completed his checklist and pressurized the locks and fuel tanks. At two minutes to launch, he tested the system by jettisoning fuel and locks. With all systems functioning, Ridley asked him if he was ready, and he replied, hell yes, let's get it over with. With that, Cardenas intoned the countdown. 10, nine, eight, seven, six, five, three, two, one, drop, 
and the X-1 fell away. Jaeger ignited all four chambers of the engine in rapid sequence and began to climb. He tested the movable stabilizer between 0.83 and 0.92 Mach and found it very effective. From 0.88 to 0.97 Mach, he once again encountered all of the transonic buffeting, instability, and other control phenomena which had by then become so familiar. And then, at 43,000 feet, the needle on his Mach meter jumped off the scale. And he radioed, Ridley, make a note. There's something wrong with this Mach meter. It's gone screwy. Ridley replied, if it is, we'll fix it. Personally, I think you're seeing things. I guess I am, Jack, Yeager answered. He just crossed the invisible threshold to flight faster than sound. A lot of people ask you, <clears throat> you know, what were your feelings on that particular day at that time? Uh, you know, after the, after on the way down, when I jettisoned the rest of fuel and, and spilled the domes, I, I really, and I knew we'd gotten above Mach 1, I think my feeling was that this program is finished, I can get on with the rest of them. That's, that's, it was one of many, you know, and it didn't mean anything as, uh, as people said later on in life. I didn't realize what it meant to the Air Force. All I know is, is that I had a feeling of accomplishment. I, I'd done what the old man sent us out to do. So. Though few people, including Chuck Yeager, could fully comprehend its implications at the time, his flight that morning was the first step in a chain of events that would ultimately vault man beyond the atmosphere and into space.